taking the climate change fight to the courts, what if destroying the environment was considered a crime against humanity? I'm Femi OK. I'm Malika Bilal, and you're in the stream. As we continue our week of shows in association with the Covering Climate Now initiative, join us in our live YouTube chat or on Twitter. Parts of the Amazon rainforest are burning, glaciers in the Arctic are melting, and governments are failing to take meaningful steps to curb climate change. As the crisis grows more dire, some activists are hoping to force the hand of companies and officials by suing them into environmental compliance. More than 1,300 climate-related lawsuits in 28 countries are currently working their way through the courts. Some plaintiffs are seeking money to cover damages from hurricanes and other disasters. Others are fighting to protect natural habitats. And a few groups want environmental harm to be declared an international crime alongside offenses such as genocide. In the past, courts have swiftly dismissed such cases, saying judges should not legislate from the bench. Critics also argue that climate change is a global problem and not the fault of any particular group. But as public opinion shifts on this issue, the tide may be starting to turn. So joining us to discuss this is Jojo Mehta from Strood in the United Kingdom. Jojo is the director of Ecological Defense Integrity and co-founder of Stop Ecocide, Change the Law. We also have with us Keitan Jha, an expert on climate litigation. Keitan is a lecturer in law at the University of Brighton in the UK. And finally, we have Mani Padma Jaina from, from Bhuban Ishwar in Odisha, India. She's an independent journalist who covers international environment issues. Welcome to the stream, everyone. I want to get started with our community. So many people watching this show and already sending in their thoughts from the get-go because this is a topic that piques a lot of interest. So this is a comment we got from Dr. Amanda Cabrero. She's a legal officer at the UN Environmental Program. And here's what she told the stream. We're following closely the debate on the concept of ecocide, but we would also want to remind everybody that there is no need to wait for ecocide laws in order to have strong legal action against environmental crimes. Most countries already have legislation to fight environmental crimes. What's been happening has been a proliferation of laws protecting the environment, but what's missing is the proper enforcement. Working to engage policymakers to raise those issues on the political agenda and the role of the public and civil society is also essential to really make this collective shift that we need. So Jojo, I'll give that one to you. If there are already laws in the books, as she mentioned, they just need enforcing, what then would ecocide tools do? What would they accomplish? So it, it's actually the enforcement aspect that I would really home in on there. Um, she's absolutely right that there are plenty of environmental laws, um, but they don't have the strength of criminal law. Um, criminal law draws a line that civil laws simply can't do. Uh, criminal law is what our first world culture, if you like, uh, uses to define what's acceptable and not acceptable. Um, in, in, in that sense, you know, you, you wouldn't apply for a permit to your government to, for a business that's going to kill people because there's a deep moral acceptance that killing people is wrong. But we don't yet have that about tr the way that we treat nature. And if we were to actually criminalize damage to nature, we would start seeing that moral acknowledgement come through. And, and of course, the enforcement, because you see individual criminal responsibility. Mm. If you talk about... Uh, a criminal act like murder, everybody knows what that is. But if you talk about ecocide, Mani Padma, in the context of India, give us a few examples of what that could be considered to be to your environment. Well, ecocide is already, I mean, when we cut deforest um, forests and when um, you're leaving uh, untreated water into uh, water bodies, uh, when you're dumping waste, uh, which pollutes the earth, and when you're using too much fertilizer, all of that is mm -hmm. ecocide. But a number of them are even laws. But the government is the worst offender in India. Let's say the municipality is the one who leaves the most untreated waste into water bodies. And industries come next. So when uh, the lady from UNEP, when she said that uh, we need to 
make policy makers aware it's it's absolutely right and it's not that the policy makers are not completely unaware they're mm-hmm. not but for example when you see sand mining many of the officials are not aware about that that it is uh, ecological uh, disaster in the making but uh, often okay. deforestation is there okay so and it's done done deliberately so that uh, industries get land all right so, so the so the, the, India, the finger it's the finger of blame is, is, is for you is, is obviously it's, it's the Indian government that has responsibility. Uh, Kate, let me just bring you into the conversation here. Uh, via a young man called Nathan Baring, he is one of a number of young Alaskans who are suing the US government because of the impact of climate change. Have a listen to how, why he explained this and how he explains this in a podcast from earlier this year. Let's have a look. I remember very distinctly asking the question, help me understand what's behind your need to do this. And I said, you know, Mom, I've used every avenue of civics that I can think of, that I can use. I have lobbied, I have organized, I have written, I have marched. And when young people have been not given the seat at the table that is quite literally determining the future that they will inherit, um, and it's being entirely determined by, you know, people in power, no matter their intentions or how good their intentions may be, they do not have to be here to experience the uh, consequences of the planet that they leave us. Kate, and I'm just wondering if the law is, is another tool of climate action, if you're seeing this happening more and more and more, where citizens of the world are saying, enough with this, we are going to the courts. What do you make of that? So I think it Uh, you know, that commenter hit it, that rather that plaintiff hit the nail on the head, because what he was trying to distill there was the idea that we've exhausted legislative avenues, we've exhausted lobbying avenues. And it's not just in the United States, this is true in the European Union as well. And one of the only things we have left, and it's it's a, a source of political forcing that has a lot of moral power, is, is the law. Um, we wouldn't be doing it if you could just go to your state legislature and make change through normal mechanisms. Um, so I, I think he's, he's precisely right on that. Um, in terms of ecocide, uh, I think it's really interesting to think about uh, what that first commenter said about the number of laws on the books. Of course, we have a lot of laws on the books. In some countries, criminal laws that might help us fight environmental harm. But as Jojo mentioned, one of the biggest issues we have is that most of our environmental laws are premised on the permitted destruction of the environment. They're premised on wastewater discharges. They're premised on allowing polluters to do things uh, in certain permissible amounts. And so uh, while we do have lots of laws on the books that could help us fight climate change, a lot of the structure of environmental law also operates against preventing harm. And I think that's something that's quite easy to miss. Mm. So I wanted to bring this in, picking up on what you said, that this is one person on Twitter who says this is then the way it should be done. This is what should happen. CEOs and government ministers would be held personally criminally responsible for any ecocide that they caused or happened under their watch. That's, this is a necessary and powerful steer for how we treat the planet we love and live on. So they're talking about CEOs and government ministers. Ketan, I'm wondering if you think that is who is responsible. Are we talking about the heads of Chevron and BP? Or are we talking about governments? Because for you, you were part of a lawsuit against the UK government. So I think what, what's crucial about this is there's no one solution in the realm of public law or in the realm of private law. It's not that responsibility lies squarely with a state or squarely with a set of corporate emitters. Um, you need the combination of both kinds of liability in particular at least potential liability, because otherwise you're going to have shifting of the blame around. You'll find a a government liable for something and have them shift a lot of the onus onto the private sector. And what you really need is a a rigid regime that allows you uh, in the appropriate amounts to find liability on both kinds of actors. Mm. So we're having this conversation here and it's quite clear uh, where the guests are coming from. Not clear, how would you get this done? So Stop Ecoside is a group that Jojo belongs to and they kind of laid it out in a couple of seconds. Have a look. Law is like a pyramid. Soft law, like the Paris Agreement, is unenforceable. It cannot protect us. Civil law, where we find most environmental regulation, also does not protect us. Suing companies is expensive and difficult. 
corporations simply budget for it and continue to pollute. Only criminal law can stop the harm. 124 states are parties to the Rome Statute, the governing document for international criminal law. Any signatory head of state can propose an amendment. When two-thirds of states sign up, it becomes law. There is no veto, no time limit, and all state parties, however small, have an equal vote. This is the legal fast lane. So, Jojo, I'm looking at that. It makes wonderful sense if you really cared about the earth. But as a major corporation, as a government, why would it be in their interest to sign up for an international law that would actually question their judgment? Mani Padma explained how many instances, just in India alone, where the government was responsible for the terrible things that were happening to the environment, allegedly, I should say. Yeah, I think what we're dealing with here is the huge disconnect between the economic structures by which we live um, and the reality of how we depend on the world around us. Um, we're not ultimately here. We're not fighting climate change. Um, I'd like to see anyone try to fight or negotiate with a hurricane. What we're fighting is a mindset. Um, what we're, you know, if there's a struggle here, it's between a way of looking at the world that treats the earth as, uh, you know, an infinite resource, which we already know categorically that it's not, um, and which treats economic growth as some kind of, you know, um, happiness in itself that we should all aspire to, when, you know, the simple logic of the situation doesn't follow that path. Um, and, you know, we've, we've lost touch with the reality that we depend absolutely upon the nature, the land, the planet on which we live and from which we, we get all our resources, all our food and everything. Um, and so, you know, what we're really looking at here is, is a mindset. Um, and actually, when we change or when we approach... Um, the, the idea of making ecocide an atrocity crime, we're putting it there on a level with, we're basically saying if you destroy the environment, it's like, you know, it's like committing a massacre and you mm. need to take responsibility for that. Um, and so, you know, when you say, you know, um, we're criticizing either the, 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 the way that governments operate, yes, that, that's actually fundamentally what's going on. And that's what the entire global climate mobilization, everyone from Extinction Rebellion to Greta to the, the youth strikes, you know, everybody is beginning to realize that that is what we actually are dealing with. So I want to bring this in from YouTube. Someone says that it is overdue, this conversation is overdue, to stop those responsible for creating pollutants to enter the environment to then be held legally accountable. But there are ideas among our community members on why it might be overdue. I want to bring in a video commenter. He's a, a barrister and a solicitor, Benjamin, and he explains this is really all about the money. The main challenge, as I see it, that faces those of us who want to criminalize the destruction of the global human life support system is that the very people who are responsible for writing laws are, in this case, also the people responsible for the activity that we are seeking to criminalize. Every government in the West subscribes to neoliberalism. Neoliberalism prioritizes corporate profits above everything else in the world. Corporations profit mostly in one way, by destroying the human life support system. We're asking government ministers to write legislation that would criminalize their own conduct. We're asking criminals to prosecute themselves. They're reluctant to do that. It's an absurd situation. Mani Padma, it is absurd in the way he lays it out there. What, what, what do you make of that? Yes, I think, and here I would like to say that uh, public opinion especially with social media coming in, is starting to play a big role in India. And I also would like to say here that, um, yes, the government, uh, in India we have a term called uh, capital cronism, where the government, the powerful people who make the policy, are, you know, hand in glove with the industrialists. So they give them the best part of the forest for a iron and steel plant where there's abundant water. And what they do is they oust the forest dwellers, they get the farmers out of there, they become migrants and lead a terrible, terrible life in cities. So yes, I completely agree with that. But public opinion, I think, is a very uh, important and powerful tool to put pressure on people who we elect. 
India is a democracy, and people are bound to listen to public opinion. I would agree with, with Manipadma absolutely about the power of public opinion making a difference. Um, I would also say that the reason that our campaign focuses on the International Criminal Court is it's one of the few, if not the only, global legal forum where the small states, um, which have the absolute uh, strongest incentive to take forward this law, have as much voice as the polluting big guys, if you like. So uh, we're working with Pacific small island states um, who are already suffering at the sharp end of climate change. They're already going underwater. They're already suffering um, a huge um, additional number of severe weather events per year, which have a massive impact. Um, and so they actually do have an incentive as states to take forward um, a law of this kind. Um, and so it's not completely um, hopeless, this idea that potentially, you know, you're asking the criminals to regulate themselves. Mm. What you're actually looking for is, um, you know, are those small states that have the courage to move this forward? Because once that happens, once somebody has the courage to propose this, we have a huge civil um, movement here that that will then have a huge lever for their own governments. And when, if, when you look if at... If I know, could what, just what add to that... Of, um, of course. Um, you know, I, I think what Benjamin pointed out is incredibly important, and it, it goes to that deep structure of the law being promulgated by those who have been really complicit in environment, environmental destruction. Um, however, we do have lots of stories about the law's transformative potential um, through piecemeal improvements like the Clean Water Act in the United States, like the Water Framework Directive in the European Union. Hey, Dan, you, and you know the that. Clean Water Act in the United States, some of it's been rolled back just recently. Uh, uh, this is and, true. And they said, that's just the beginning. We're going to roll some more back. But if it was a criminal offence, maybe that law would stick. Um, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Right, I, 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 I'm interrupting the, 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 the law uh, uh, litigator, so I shouldn't really be doing that. But I just want to push back a little bit, because in the United States, if you cite that as an example, uh, just recently, just in the last two weeks, uh, some of the Clean Water Act has, has, has been rolled back. Let me put this to you. I want to put this case to you, and I, I'm going to do it via... Uh, some extreme weather video from Pakistan. So I want to show you some flooding. And Kaitan, I, I want to put this case to you. It was a successful case of Askar Lagari. He is a farmer in the South Punjab region, region of Pakistan. He took his own government to court to say that they were threatening his livelihood, his life, because of climate change, because um, uh, uh, water and food and energy, all of that was insecure. I, and he won the case, which is interesting, because how do you say that your government is responsible for something that is happening around you that is very hard to say, oh, well, the flooding, that is your fault, or the food insecurity, that is your fault? How do you do that, Kaitan? So uh, the meat of the Ligari case boils down to uh, a piece of executive policy, the national climate change policy in Pakistan, which is a whole suite of uh, administrative measures meant to combat climate change. Now, uh, it goes back to something I think my first commenter mentioned, which is that we have a huge enforcement gap. And where Ligari succeeded was in arguing that undue delay uh, in terms of enforcing this executive policy was unlawful, that you are not allowed as a government to simply sit around mm. and uh, pledge uh, this sort of paltry political commitment uh, and not do anything about it. So it's a real success story uh, there. And I think it plays on a history of enforcement litigation where environmental litigators, and, and of course, it's, it's worth pointing out uh, that Lagari was not just a farmer, he was also a law student. <laughs> so he had the power of narrative on his side as well. Yeah, good for him. Um, and I think that's an important kind of litigation. Mm. But there's something else, you know, lurking in the footnotes of legal history in terms of ecocide that means we can go a step further than simply these sorts of environmental enforcement cases. And that's the fact that we did, within the Rome Statute, have something called Article 26 um, in the 90s during the drafting and of the And then just Rome remind Statute. everybody the Rome Statute is... So the Rome Statute is what creates the International Criminal Court. Thank um, you. And what, during its drafting stage, there was actually uh, a provision on ecocide that was essentially included. And not only was it included, uh, one of the salient debates was not whether ecocide ex was uh, something that should become actionable, but rather uh, how we deal with the intent element of ecocide. And uh, delegates from Belgium in, in the there? early 90s... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's... Um... 
<clears throat> it, it, you're absolutely right because it, it, there's a difference here with the other from from other atrocity crimes. I mean, if you're going to commit, you know, if you're going to go to war on somebody, effectively, you kind of have to have the intent to go to war on somebody. Um, whether, whereas with Ika's side, um, what we are really looking at is a situation of what we might call in UK law recklessness. In other words, you're committing an act where you're intending to commit the act, but you're not necessarily expressly intending to commit ecocide. But on the intent side of things, what we're looking at is knowledge or the fact that you should have known that your act was going to lead to ecocide. So in that way, yes, it is a little different. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that that would actually be the, the, the premise on which it would be included as an atrocity crime would be as a crime of recklessness or, or negligence, if you like, of ignoring and, knowledge that you should have had. So, Jojo, I and take your point. I, I take your point there, but I want to raise it with another point, with another legal mind. In fact, this is Donald. He's a law professor. And here is his take. Climate change is real and it should be addressed. But the courts are not the appropriate forum for finding relief from its effects or funding its abatement. Our constitutional separation of powers commits policymaking decisions to the legislature and elected branches, not the courts creating retroactive criminal or civil liability. Furthermore, from a comparative institutional competency perspective, the elected branches are simply better at this task. They're capable of taking in evidence, making prospective rules, weighing competing com policy considerations, having public participation, having rigorous, transparent, and open debate. The courts can do none of this. Furthermore, the legislature is going to be held accountable if they get it wrong, courts cannot. So Jojo, he says the courts aren't the best place for this. What would you say back to him? Um, I would say that actually it's not the courts that make these decisions. If you were going to, um, if you were going to add ecocide to the Rome Statute, that wouldn't be the court deciding to do that. That would be the heads of state and their delegations, and presumably influenced by their electorate. And they would be the ones that were, would be debating this and ultimately putting it into international law. It's not the court itself that does that. If I could jump in there, um, I, you know, that's a really interesting professorial exegesis. But I think the, the fundamental issue with it is no one is saying that courts are an efficient solution. No one is saying that in light of what we know about political administration across jurisdictions, that somehow the quickest or best way to solve any of the harms that come about as a result of climate change is through a judicial system. Uh, I, I don't know anyone who takes that right. proposition terribly seriously, but it's a mechanism of last resort because our more efficient mechanisms have not yet worked and we're running out of time. All right, guess I'm going to ask you this. I'm going to put you all on the spot, but a good spot. If you could take, if we actually had an international criminal law, a harm against our environment, what would be the first case that you would take? Uh, and this is a sentence, really. Uh, Manu Padma, go ahead. What would be the first case for you? Where in the world do you think we need this international the law first, right the now? The first case would, uh, I think the first case would be for farmers in India. Okay. I think the farmers should be actually uh, questioning the policies of the government, Farmers policies in regarding India. the... Okay. All right. Keitan, yeah. what would you be using this international criminal law if it comes into being? I won't be terribly original here. I, I will uh, wholly agree. Uh, farmers in the global south, absolutely. All right, so you copied there, but that's okay. Jojo, what would you be using the Ecoside international criminal law for when, if it comes into being? Do you know what? I'm going to slightly sidestep that because, I mean, there are many that I could name. All right. But I think the real power of this is that once you actually see it appearing over the horizon, in other words, once you get to the point where a state is prepared to say, we believe this is an atrocity crime, you're actually going to start to see a transition period. You're right, going to start okay. to see a change in people's you know, moral conception. So ideally, in my ideal world, I would see nobody in the dock. Oh, because I love by that. Time Positive. It because by the time it actually got ratified by everybody, yep. it, people, the practices would have changed so much that you actually would have stopped the harm, which is the ultimate intention. All right. Right, Jojo, thank you so much for that. We will end our conversation there. Thank you, Jojo. Thank you, Keitan. Thank you, Mana Padma, for helping us understand this idea about uh, holding ourselves accountable and our major companies and also governments through criminal law. Our coverage of the climate crisis continues on the next episode of The Stream. Mm -hmm. Is the climate apocalypse upon us or is there still time? We will find out on Thursday. Thanks for scaring us. <laughs> I try. Mike and I will see you next time.